the one drop. <laughs> See, um, this was written in response to the death of Stephen Lawrence. Not so much the death of Stephen Lawrence, because people have been stabbing each other from the beginning of time, but more like um, the police investigation into the death of Stephen Lawrence. So. Um, uh, this year marks 20 years since the death of Stephen Lawrence. Now, I don't know if you know this, but um, two years ago, two of the people responsible for the murder got banged up. Yeah, two of the people got like 15 years in prison. And did you know that the only evidence that they had to bang them up was one drop of blood? That was the only real evidence. All the rest of the evidence was circumstantial. One drop of blood. And 20 years ago, when it first happened, they didn't even bother looking for the one drop of blood. But the mother just kept banging on and banging on about it. So eventually, after six years, they looked at all the evidence again, got a microscope, and lo and behold, they found the one drop of blood. But you know what? They couldn't even get DNA off it properly then. So anyway, years later, um, science caught up. Um, they, got, they got the DNA off it. Um, and as we know, two of those little fuckers got banged up. So this was my response to it. I'm reminded of the Bob Marley song. Where you where you where you where you 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 Feel it in the one drop, and we still find time to rock. We feel in a rhythm when Bob Marley did rock steady. You know me. I'm the beat that the drummer did drop in steady liquors with a rim shot. And then we all feel it in the one drop. When one was dropped into those coloured slots, one drop divided up into racial constructs, but one drop must have got into the melting pot. Yo, tell me where your people from, because we're all fucking mixed up. <laughs> Check your pedigree and I bet you find that one drop. Well, it was the one drop that decided whether you got a share of the pot or whether you had to leg it from the lynch mob. Yo, are you fucking keeping up? I'm telling you, even if they found one drop, you were fucked. Yet, it was that one drop of pluck that runneth over the cup that gave Rosa Parks the pluck. She said, you know what? I ain't gonna give my seat up. And while I'm at it, let me explain my personal position. For now, I'll tick ballot box, I'll even sign the petition. But if we cannot cotch at the table and suck from the cup, then we'll burn shit down and mash shit up because we are the one drop. We cannot be stopped. We've existed over epoch and we come in many constructs. We are not just that one drop in the ocean. Open your eyes up and you'll find the ocean in that one drop. So stick that in your homeopathic concoct. And nowadays, I've been immortalised. <laughs> I've been popularised by medicine, DNA, CSI. And you want to know why? Well, it takes a little while to unlock my mystery, but every time they spot me, I make history. So, you know what? When they lunched up at the bus stop, that modern day lynch mob, they were probably all self-medicated, you know, shored up. They were definitely premeditated because they were tooled up. And you know the upshot. Run, Stephen, come on, keep up. If they catch us, we're fit as fuck. My boy ran 200 yards until he stopped, until he dropped bleeding profusely from two fatal cuts, which dumbass cops never even tried to stop and apply a little first aid bomb. And you saw in the voice newspaper, the photo shot of the mother face palm and the dad with his hands over his head top. Yo pups, how are you gonna clean this shit up? Not with a thousand mops. Oh, police investigation. Ha, don't make me laugh. You what? It was a cock up that a crooked cop had been paid to obstruct. I mean, the examination didn't reveal the one drop. One drop ain't so easy to spot, but you know what? Those fucks they just gave up, locked shit up in a property box to mold and rot, leaving those little fascist fucks free of Scott, bowling round the estate like they was a top notch. Huh. Just watch. In her grief and despair, she called on me, the one drop. And we made a pact there and then that we'd never give up. As long as her veins held one drop, she was not going to give up. And Stephen was not going to get forgot. So with me, the one drop, she filled up her pot. And when they run it over, she got out her mop. And she forced those fascist cops to clean their shit up. And you know what? Things actually change. Laws had to be rearranged. That racist institution was named and shamed. And when science finally caught up with me, the one drop, well, that's when it all came on top. I was the one drop that made the lie stop, and now at least two of those little fascist fucks are banged up. And I know nowadays prison is kind of cushy, but for the next 15 years, they ain't getting no pussy. Cause pets are not allowed in prison. And there may come a time when we can forgive them, but that time ain't right now. So you know what? Fuck them. And I think whenever Stephen is brought up, and I think about what it has taught us. It's the same old cliche said in so many better ways, you never give up. But when your ass is down on the wire, call on that one drop and you know what? You'll find a fucking reservoir. Why yo, why yo, why yo, why yo, 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 yo. Feel it in the one drop. Uncle Errol knew me. Before when you saw me, that was the old me. I wasn't this new me that now stands before you. I might look the same, but I'm telling you, I've changed. And this is a brand new me. 
This is the me that's resided in me that's decided to be and is now demanding expression. This is the me that's required to be, that's inspired, you see. And now, before my confession, this is a new me, so excuse me while I read the warranty and the clause. Well, it says here quite clearly that this here, the new me, is complete home without any flaw. The old me would scold me. Many times old me told me that I wasn't good enough to do shit. The best thing about the new me is that I now know that the old me was talking a load of it. And you know what's more? All that shit I've done before, I've been absolved. The universe isn't keeping score. This is a new me, no longer unruly when things don't go my way or people don't do as I say. That was the old me and you could not console me when I would fly into a rage, but it's okay, old me's not around anymore. I've got him locked up in a cage. This is a new me, no more excuses based on my upbringing and my history. I've become a bit of a sage, I've turned a new page and I'm writing a brand new story. This is a new me, now to express what I think I transform paper with ink and I save all my rant and my rage for the stage. The new me knows that the new me knows that there's nothing wrong with me, that what's right with me can't fix. I'll give you that for free. That's a solution-focused therapy tip from my therapist. Now, how to get the best of this new me? Best not pick a fight with me. The old me was out of control before. We don't want to invite an encore. Shine a light on what's right with me if you want to stay tight with me anyway. This is a new me. There's nothing you can do me. You can even boo me. I fucking love you, so sue me. The new me is still me, you feel me? I'm just acting with a little bit more responsibility. Oh, you are going to become so fond of this newfound ability to respond. See, I'm taking life a bit more seriously, even though I'm still very boyful. Every day, the new me writes down 10 reasons to feel joyful. Because the new me knows that all that matters is that I feel good. And this is something that the old me never properly understood. So I stand up more straight. I breathe more deeply. I fucking meditate. And you know what? It's like being connected to another state. I call it my essence, my essence, my spirit, my zing. All I know is that my bling is within and my heart no longer feels so tight and gloomy. It feels more light and roomy. Oh, this new me so bright and bloomy. The old me was so criticizing, but this new me, whoa, I got that Kundalini rising. And this is just the beginning because while those tracker wheels are spinning, I get win-win situations with all my fellow beings. Uh, do you like this new me? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to do me? I would do two if I could do myself, which is really ironic because I've told the old me to go and fuck himself. <laughs> if your cow won't go moo, I mean if your old you won't do, then you've got to be like me and find yourself a brand new you. You feel like you've got a seat on the front row pew, a room with a view. I said before when you saw me, that was the old me. I wasn't this new me that now stands before you. But should I tell you something truly? I was always a new me. You just never really knew me. This one's called um, Autonomy. <laughs> she comes to me. She doesn't walk, she doesn't walk, she runs to me. On sunny Sunday morning, she runs to me to snuggle up and snuggle up and slum with me. She sniggers every time I sniff her neck, she's just my little slumming bee. In dungaree she comes to me, a whirl of yellow trainers, red socks and limbs like sleek mahogany. She comes to me, she sings songs to me, when she doesn't know the words she just hums to me. And me, I hum along in harmony, she's just my little humming bee. She comes to me spontaneously, decides to practice, I don't know what the fuck that is, yoga, gymnastics, performing symphonies of angles and curves like some sacred geometry right in front of me. Then it's breakfast in bed, she says, and we feast on the scrambled eggs and the toasted bread, what she done for me. The eggs and bread was bought from the farmer's market with the last of her money, so she informs me. Then she finds a plastic bottle and she starts to build a bomb for me. I say, whoa, 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 what the fuck are you doing? But you see, she doesn't respond to me. She's got autonomy. She takes a deep, long, bubbly lung full and then passes it on to me. Well, I can't lock her up in a nunnery. I said she's got autonomy. And anyway, fuck it, it's Sunday. So we take that shit out onto the balcony where we discuss the Freemasons and the Illuminati. Apparently, Jay-Z and Beyonce. Conversationally, she's so profound. She speaks so eloquently. It must come from me and we. We're just a couple of buzzing bees. This isn't wrong to me, smoking a bong with my boo on the balcony. What's wrong to me is previously what love done to me. I allowed the sting to get stung in me and in this ensuing cacophony, what was once a national park, I mean my heart became a slum to see. But then she comes to me, dropped a love bomb on me, undoing the wrongs in me. Look, 
I'm her biggest fan, yet she comes to me. Reminding me that what's right can heal what's wrong with me. That's why she's always banging a gong for me. She comes to me, belongs to me, and nothing she could ever do could ever be wrong to me. And honestly, I don't even question how long she's going to hang on to me. She resisted years of propaganda not to be with me. Right now, this is where she wants to be, at one with me. And as for me, you couldn't hold a fucking gun to me. I said she comes to me. Could I compare her to a summer's day? Well, yeah, I could, but I'd have to include the Milky Way. I'd have to include those other unnamed galaxies. Fuck, I'd have to change my vocabulary. I'd have to learn the language of astrology, because we're talking light years away. And when she smiles, shit, that's it. Now we're beyond galactic. Now we're in the realms of the esoteric. I'd have to learn some ancient African script, maybe some Hebrew or Sanskrit, just to explain it. And I, like a summer's day, couldn't come close to a comparison, because this is a passion beyond the mere summer's day. This girl, she's an anomaly. The Big Bang, she's the bomb to me. I've been trying to hold it down, but shit, she's on to me. She's starting to tease me, make fun of me. She knows I'm sprung on her. In my defence, I make fun of her. A little sauce on the radio, a little jasmine reggae. I pull her up to come and dance with me. I spin her around twice, I pull her close to me, and then she <laughs> vomits all over me. See, the young girls, they just can't take the sense. So, I dive in the shower, and I leave her to clean up for me. She swears that she's never, ever, ever going to smoke again. Well, she's got autonomy and quite frankly, experience is a better teacher than I could ever be. So I make her a cup of blueberry tea. She starts to sip it and settle comfortably, but too soon she's got to go. She's meeting her mum at three. She warns me not to mention her smoking. I say, uh, do I look crazy? She says, actually, Dad, sometimes, just a little bit, maybe. She says she's broke now, can she get some from me? I say, how much you need? She says, a one. I say, yeah, you wish I'd give her 40 quid and then she's gone from me. All around me are dedicated writers. They live for those literary moments. Me, I'm a dedicated fighter. And words, words have always been my opponent from the very first moment. Look, in the beginning was the word, and the word had flow. Knew where it had to go, guided by a primary impulse, along the path of least resistance, on a mission to illuminate the crown. It was these words that carried light at the speed of sound. And these words, when narrated, vibrated. And the people who heard them elated, delighted. You know you can't fight it. When these words hit the scent and your soul gets excited. When you gasp in the dark and you grasp where the light is. Magical symbols and metaphors, opening subconscious doors. Sages from across the ages carved these words onto cave walls and then scribed onto scrolls by ancient scholars and bards telling stories of stars. It was these words that kept us connected with that from which we are carved. But Instead of travelling directors, you'd expect these words got intercepted by the intellect, got taken out of context and attached to a false pretext, and analysed and summarised into grotesque muted versions of their original self. These words stripped of their wealth and worked into lessons they lie about blessings. In the beginning were these flaky white scraps words scraped, screeching in protest onto blackboards. Not that I ever took any notice, see? Pedagogy got groggy, fell asleep, I was that bored. Teacher talk time, teacher talk time, my fall asleep time, time to dream up rhymes. Now, I've been doing this for a couple of years now, and I'm aware that there are some poets they avoid using rhyme. I'm aware of this fact. The question remains though, why the fuck do they do that? <laughs> In the beginning was Dr. Zeus. He put to use a rhyme and repetition roost that first triggered the juice that whetted the appetite that I now constantly fight to satisfy. Because now it's down to me to get the right words in the right freaking order. In the beginning was the word that cried to be heard, yet for nearly 50 years I've been resisting these words, but they never gave up, they kept insisting these words. So now it's down to me to get the right words in the right freaking order. If I am to get out these words that are thinking around in my head, there's no way around it. I've got to keep on inking and laying down lead till I can recite these words that will bring a joy that these words will never explain. So. If you find yourself at a loss for words, well, these, there's these words that will offer direction. Make a selection and don't watch a saliva. You ain't going to drag because these words will revive you. <laughs> now, I know. I know these words ain't the most elegant. If eloquence is a flight of a swan, I'm more your freaking elephant. But you know what? I wrote these words. And I hope some of these words hit the spot. If not, I'm fucked, because these words are all I got. Well, these words and the friends I share them with, because you're the pith, the core of my existence. So these words may need a little assistance not to get caught up on the weeds and the rocks, the communication that blocks the whys and the whats. With a little paddle on your part, these words can hit the mark. See, these words are not aiming for the head. These words are for the heart. And I know they're not perfect, but at least they will start. 
this ain't for you. This ain't for you and this definitely ain't for you because this one, well this one's for the London lonely. For those who ain't got a one and only, their hearts have no home. And so they roam along the south bank, look at them, staggered file and rank, eyes cast down and damp. This is for those who don't do eye contact, cause if they did you'd feel taken aback, almost under attack by a sadness caused by delusions of lack. They're dotted around the city in their dozens and hundreds. This one's for the lonely Londoners, the West End wanderers, the Soho stumblers with chat up lines on pieces of paper. Conversation starters might come in handy later, but this one, this one's for the hesitators, the social life procrastinators. I mean, people, why do you hesitate? You've heard about the three second rule, yeah? If you see someone you like, you gotta go in straight. Don't freaking hesitate. When you hesitate, you seal your fate. He who hesitates, masturbates. <laughs> this is for those who daily delete their internet history. And how they've even had a love life is a mystery. Oh, this one's for the lonely Londoners. This one's for the London lonely, the ones who feel they are the ones and only who's ever felt like this, who never ever felt it would come to this. They're the, well, they're the love song mumblers, the romance blunderers, so steeped in solitude, perhaps a cat at home, hardly ever speak to anyone, perhaps a cat's got their tongue. But this, this is for those whose minds ain't so sound. Or maybe they are and we just need to come around. But you see them, they wander up and down and around and around like they were happy once. And as if looking for the source, they go back and forth, back and forth on oyster cards topped up with a couple of pounds. This one's for the London lonely underground. On the circle line, they go round and round. This is for those who mind the gap. This is for the night bus insomniacs. This is for those who often hear, uh, excuse me, this bus terminates here. And this is for those on the edges of town. And this is for those on the edge looking down and seeing nothing but murky greys. Look, no matter where you come from, this is for those who feel they don't belong, who dine alone and so they hunger as they plunder the depths of their disconnection with all that is. All that is, is a Delusions of loneliness. I mean, you know that all is well, that nothing is amiss, that all they need to do is to follow their bliss, but they cannot get a whiff of bliss. So, you've got an exhibition to see at the Tate Modern. You got invited by that person you fancy like rotten. And then later on at Wagon Mummers, you got a table booked for eight. Cause you've got loads of friends and you've got a birthday to celebrate. You got people to see and people to do. Well, this ain't for you. This one's for the London lonely. But those who ain't got a one and only, their hearts have no home and so they roam.